On this episode of Skeptico, Alex talks with noted abduction researcher and Temple University history professor, Dr. David Jacobs. You mean to tell me, an academic would say, that not only are aliens coming from uh, outer space, which we all know they can't, they can't get here from there, and now they're kidnapping people because they want to see what makes us tick and all that? And no, 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 no. Now, I don't care what the reasons are for why they don't do it. What the scientific and, and academic community is doing is they are simply abrogating their responsibility to study this subject. You have to understand, for example, the UFO phenomenon and the abduction phenomenon together are global in nature. Everybody and everything, that includes animals, see these objects and react to them. Not only that, let me tell you a few other things that just astonish me every time I think about it. In the abduction phenomenon, people are physically missing from their normal environments when they are abducted. Police have been called, search parties have been sent out, kids hunt for their parents, parents hunt for their children during abductions, they're not there. And this phenomenon is not happening. Not only that, people are abducted in groups and can confirm each other's abductions, and yet it's not happening. People return from abductions and they have unusual marks and scars on their body and sometimes, and I have seen this, fully formed scar tissue literally the next day. That is not possible and yet this phenomenon is not happening. People return from abductions without their clothes and never finding their clothes again. Sometimes they return from abductions wearing somebody else's clothes. And yet it's not happening. So if I grant that it's not happening, then abduction researchers have stumbled on one of the most important areas of human cognition that has ever been found. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and on this episode of Skeptico, as you just heard, we welcome David Jacobs. Now, you might recall a couple episodes ago, I mentioned that I was going to be doing this series on the intersection of alien contact and extended human consciousness, what I think is just a fascinating topic. Well, Today's guest, David Jacobs, if you don't already know, is quite a controversial figure in this mix. And I guess the reasons why he's controversial are many and somewhat complicated. And I think to explain it, as I think I should, we need to almost have a brief history of the entire UFO phenomena. Let me give that a try. As I sit here today, 2013, I think we can say the UFO phenomena is an accepted reality. More people believe than don't believe. Those figures skew even higher the younger you go and the more educated you go. It's also, of course, been established through the release of previously classified documents that our government has had a long time interest in UFOs, despite their statements to the contrary, has been very involved. And then further, from a, on a worldwide basis, we know that other governments have just come out and released all their documents. And that's pretty amazing stuff, including multiple sightings by military witnesses, public witnesses, air chases, all the rest. So the reason to go there is to explain how David Jacobs fits into that landscape. And it's a curious fit because even though the UFO phenomena is at the point where we can say it's accepted, the alien contact and alien abduction phenomena, uh, not so much. And it's kind of a strange situation because if you think it through, what are you really saying? If you say, I believe in life on other planets, I believe visitation through these sightings, but I don't believe these numerous people in all sorts of different walks of life throughout the world. I don't believe their claims of direct contact with these beings or this other consciousness. We could get into all that, but with these beings, let's keep it simple. Now that's a rather strange position to advance. As a matter of fact, if you look at the data on that simple fact, that is shifting too, because I think that strangeness of it means that a lot of people 
will get there eventually. They just haven't quite settled into really accepting what that means. I mean, if you accept that, hey, there was an alien spaceship in the air and we chased it and it got away, is it really that much of a leap to suggest that they visited some people and had contact with them? No, it's just unsettling, so you don't really want to go there, but it's really not that big of a leap. So now back to David Jacobs. Along comes David Jacobs, who famously, along with Bud Hopkins, for the last 30 years, has been claiming that he's been working directly with people who've had this abduction experience. And he's claimed that through hypnotherapy and hypnotic regression, he's been able to get detailed accounts of what's going on. So I think you knew all that, but if you didn't, that's a little bit of an intro to frame up this debate, if you will, this schism between whether that alien contact is some kind of quasi-spiritual experience, as we explored with Mary Rodwell, or, as you'll hear from Dr. Jacobs, that experience is truly an abduction, an invasion, and an invasion that suggests a much more sinister motive behind this contact with these others. So that's one way in which Dr. Jacob is this highly controversial figure within the UFO community. But the other way that he's controversial, and this I think has to be brought up because so many people who are really into this material know about a lot of the negative things that have come up about David Jacobs and his techniques, methodologies, and the claims of his inappropriate sessions with one particular abductee he was working with. So before doing this interview, I talked with Dr. Jacobs about that case. I also independently talked to a couple of Dr. Jacobs detractors, all in an attempt to get a handle on what to make of this pretty big body of work that he's amassed and his claims about the alien abduction phenomena. What I decided at the end of the day was that we do need to listen to Dr. Jacobs. We do need that voice out there. And although some of the techniques he's used in the past have been called into question, I don't think it undermines his work. And I think people who attack it from that front are usually folks who are not willing to accept any hypnotic regression work, which I just don't understand. I don't understand how you can think that anyone who's had a hypnotic regression, even a mild one where someone's just told to relax and count back to 10, how everything after that that they might say or remember is tainted. I understand that the techniques and the methodologies that we use have to be careful, but I don't think hypnotic regression immediately taints all memories that someone might have. So my interview with David Jacobs was a pretty long one. I've actually broken it up into two segments to broadcast here on Skeptico. One, because of the length, but also because there's a real shift in the interview. The first talks about existing body of work, some of the groundwork for his beliefs and his understandings that he's gained. And the second shifts more into the topic that I started with Mary Rodwell on, and that's how we should understand this experience vis-a-vis these two camps, this John Mack spiritual transformation alien contact camp and this David Jacobs and now deceased Bud Hopkins camp who sees it as an intrusion, an alien abduction with a very sinister motive behind it. Okay, so thanks for staying with me for that lengthy introduction. Here goes with Dr. David Jacobs. Today we welcome historian and UFO abduction researcher Dr. David Jacobs to Skeptico. Dr. Jacobs is the author of four books and many, many important articles. He's done numerous television and radio appearances, all on this topic that he is really one of the pioneers in, and that is alien abduction research. Dr. Jacobs, it's great to have you on. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Alex. Well, as I mentioned, you know, for anyone who has even a passing interest in this field, they know about you, they know about your work, and they probably also know that one of the reasons that a lot of folks are drawn to you is because you have this very interesting dual career. You were a longtime history professor at Temple University in Philadelphia before your retirement. And as I was looking over your bio, I noticed that you were 
also someone who you had to be the first person to do a PhD dissertation on UFOs. I have to ask you right from the outset, how did you pull that off? That was actually tricky. Um, uh, first of all, I, I, I was actually, if you want to speak technically, a guy named Mike Schutz at, uh, at um, Northwestern University did a paper, a uh, sociology dissertation on UFO uh, groups or cults or whatever. Uh, and uh, he got his PhD one month before I did. Uh So so, uh, technically speaking, I am the second dissertation that dealt with UFOs. Uh, His was the first, but basically it's close enough to be almost a tie. Uh, However, I addressed the the controversy over it. I was actually working on a dissertation on the image of women in very early uh, film history, pre-1915 was sort of my target date. And I had done about six months worth of research on that, but uh, in my fetid brain, all I did was think about UFOs uh, and and the UFO phenomenon, and I I had become enamored with it back in the mid-60s. And uh, and I was going home every day and and reading uh, reading it, uh, reading Flying Saucer Review and the APRO Bulletin and UFO investigators from NICAP and other organizations now now defunct. And um, eventually, I realized that there hadn't been a a serious history of the subject uh, of the controversy over it uh, since since the Rupold book uh, reported on unidentified flying objects, and his was basically a first person report as opposed to a history of it. And so uh, I uh, approached my major professor. This is at the University of Wisconsin. He was my sort of mentor. Uh, who told me that um, this was a great idea, this was a wonderful idea, he loved this idea, I could switch dissertation topics, and goodbye, and he went off to Rutgers University with that. Mm -hmm. So I was left without a major professor, without a mentor, and I chose a guy named um, Paul Konkin, who was a, a sort of steel trap mind guy of the history department, which had the best history department in the United States at the time at the University of Wisconsin in the the 60s. And uh, he was not impressed with this topic. And uh, uh, I I sort of tried to show him that that the topic uh, was different than what he thought it was. And there was a large public history about UFOs, which involved uh, government agencies and uh, national organizations and this and that. And he still was uh, unsure, and I finally, I finally saw him in the hallway, and, I, and he said, write me up a, a, a prospectus of a couple of pages. So I wrote it up for him, and I waited and waited and waited and waited. Now, this guy was uh, really hard-nosed. I cannot emphasize that enough. And he never responded, and I finally ran into him in the hallway one day, and I said, uh, Mr. Conkin, everybody called uh, uh, all the professors Mr. there at Wisconsin. I said, Mr. Conkin, did you read my perspective? Perspectives? He said, yeah, I read it. I said, well, what, what did you think? He said, well, okay. So he was just trying to think of a reason to not approve it, and that's right. what, that was the delay, huh? He he said, okay. And as soon as he said, okay, with an exasperating tone, I became his student. That's the way the system was. I suddenly was in his seminar. I could do no wrong. I was now a member of the elite. And uh, so he helped me guide me through a dissertation that was ultimately publishable by the University of Indiana Press. And it became the second PhD uh, dissertation ever written on the subject of UFOs of any sort. Yeah, that's pretty amazing in and of itself. And then what I guess is even more amazing is you were able to kind of manage this two-track career, if you will, although the tracks were completely separate. You were a successful academic and historian at very respected university, Temple University there. And at the same time, where you're best known throughout the world is as this researcher that pioneered this research into just about the most controversial of phenomena you can imagine, the idea of alien abduction. So 
You know, I can't imagine that your research interest in alien abduction helped your academic career. Uh, probably the opposite. Uh, yes, I would say that you're right. It, it was the opposite. Uh, I knew going in, eyes open, that uh, talking about people who were being abducted uh, into flying saucers was not exactly going to increase my um, credibility within the, the, the history department at Temple and would probably help to uh, stop my career in mid-track. Uh, I had tenure, and uh, which is one of the greatest things uh, ever in the history of academe, uh, now under assault across the country, incidentally. But um, it allowed me to do what I, what I wanted to do while keeping up all my other duties and teaching all my classes and doing other research uh, at Temple University as well. It did, however, uh, stop my career in terms of moving up uh, up the academic ladder, but as long as I had tenure, uh, uh, that's 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 all I needed. And uh, so I retired in uh, in 2011, and um, now I'm trying to write uh, three books and uh, uh, trying desperately to finish one I've been working on for about four or five years. I'm coming to the end of it. I've uh, finished. Uh, I've got a rough draft of another one, and and yet there's a third one that I'm that I'm going to do. And when those are all finished, I will hang up my brains, and that's going to be the end of it. Uh, well, we'll see. A lot of people claim that, and they're never able to hang up their brains. But we'll see. Hey, uh, speaking of books, 13 years ago, the year 2000, you edited a book titled "UFOs and Abductions: Challenging the Borders of Knowledge." In it, you said that the study of UFO merits serious attention from the intellectual establishment. You also said something interesting that I'd like to get you to comment on, and that is lack of academic participation creates a vicious cycle that prevents the development of standards that would attract greater academic participation and thus greater credibility. Tell us about that and tell us what has changed in the last 13 years. Well, in the last 13 years, uh, well, first of all, this is, a, this is a subject that is bereft of academic participation. By academic, I mean scientific community and the academic community. The scientific community is one part of the study of this. It is not necessarily the critical part. The, anybody who has... Uh, and, and academic training, basically anybody who has, who, who can think logically can do this kind of work. It's so unprecedented that it doesn't require expertise in any particular subject to get an insight into it because it's, it's, it's unique. Uh, however, um, what, we've, what I've seen, and, uh, and it was happening 13 years ago, is that over the years, the academic community and scientific community and professional community, uh, that is to say dentists, lawyers, people like that, um, have given their names in public to UFO organizations to be consultants to these groups. Uh, there's Mutual UFO Network, the Aerial Phenomena Research uh, uh, um, organization, the uh, National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, the Fund for UFO Research, and so on. And these organizations published lists of uh, academics and, and scientists and, and others, professionals, uh, who had given their full names and allowed them to be used in public as consultants. I counted up the number of names of everybody who had a postgraduate uh, degree, uh, that included PhDs and, and uh, master's degrees. It came to about 1,200 individuals. That was years and years and years ago. Now the academic community has no interest in this subject whatsoever. There aren't 1,200 people across the country who are academics who, are, who will lend their names to uh, organizations. Uh, and in fact, what we find is that the academic community, professional community, whatever, is downright hostile to the subject. It's not that they're not interested. They're actively hostile. Right. So the vicious cycle has turned into an outright war. 
Right. And this is the first time that this has happened since the beginning of the phenomenon. There's never been a period in, in UFO history where, where you get this kind of hostility, except perhaps in the first uh, two years between 47 and 49, something like that. But even then, it was more curiosity. Uh, uh, now it's hostility. You just it, it, it's really astonishing. I, th I think it's because of three reasons. Whether you agree with these reasons or not, I'm not going to make a value judgment on them. I think number one is the uh, the, the idea of, of a government cover up. I think that uh, that that to ask the academic community to believe that UFOs are real, they're from outer space, they're here uh, doing this, that, and the other thing, and the government knows all about them, and the government is hiding information, and the government might even have one or two, and, and they might even have aliens who are pickled in jars, and and all, all that sort of stuff. Um, that is a let's just say a turnoff to use an old phrase for academics. That's like, especially for social scientists. That is just impossible to imagine and it, uh, uh, it just it goes against every grain of knowledge of the government and how the government works that all political scientists and historians and sociologists and whatever they all they all know that 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 this is this is not not necessarily the way things work so so really, however let me let, let's just fine-tune that point a little bit so what you're saying is maybe 10 20 years ago before the whole story really got fleshed out more and we really understood all these documents that have now surfaced that show clearly there was a, a government intelligence interest in this topic, at the very least. I mean, that's clearly documented. And then oh, that absolutely. contradicts the official position. So I think now you're saying once people really internalize that there is a serious – a uh, problem here in terms of the government's position, then that's uh, uh, one more reason to say, hey, just pull back from that. That's not going to do anything but crush my uh, my career. So uh, one more reason to step back, right? Right, exactly. W whether you agree with, with government to secrecy or not, it, it doesn't matter. For the academic community, it's just, it's nonsensical. And when, because, you didn't, when you didn't know about it, you could have blindly put your name on some MUFON list. But now that you know that, you're like, nah, better not. Right. That's that's one area. A second area is uh, popular culture. Uh, uh, if you watch uh, television, uh, cable TV, cable TV is now ha ha now has a lot of shows that will deal with UFOs, abductions, and all that. And uh, some of these shows are actually very good. Uh, right. Uh, most of them are, aren't aren't very good, aren't in the very good category. Let's just say, but it become but the net effect of this is it becomes just another part of popular culture. It becomes a popular culture a meme, so to speak. It, it becomes just a thing that happens uh, in the society, and and it is not really a scientific and academic subject. It's a popular culture subject. And scientists stay away from popular culture unless, of course, they're historians or, or sociologists. Uh, and consequently, uh, I think that that has hurt uh, the, uh, the, the entrance of ac academics into this study. The third thing is abductions. You mean to tell me, an academic would say, that not only are aliens coming from uh, outer space, which we all know they can't, they can't get here from there because even at the speed of light, uh, you know, it would take, uh, uh, well, you know the argument, blah, 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 blah. Um, so they and 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 now they're kidnapping people because they want to see what makes us tick and all that. Uh, no, 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 no. These three things, I think, uh, popular culture, uh, secrecy, uh, and uh, abductions have managed to just close the door on the academic community. They just don't want to enter into this stew, this melange of things uh, that, that, that are swirling around the UFO sighting phenomenon. And uh, so uh, it's, it's, you, you can understand why. Now, I don't care what the reasons are for why they don't do it. What, what the scientific and, and academic community is doing is they are simply abrogating their responsibility to study this subject. You have to understand, for example, the, the UFO phenomenon and the abduction phenomenon together are global in nature. 
with everybody and everything, that includes animals, see these objects and react to them. Uh, and in the abduction phenomenon, what you have is people coming from all around the world, with from all different walks of life, having wildly different backgrounds, uh, from PhDs and MDs and psychiatrists and psychologists to people who dropped out of school in the 12th grade or, 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 the, or the ninth grade, uh, when they were 12 years old, for example, I have one person like that, or in uh, the ninth grade, uh, and, and, and people could never hold a job and get it together, all saying the same exact things from around the world. And, uh, and, and yet... There's no interest in this whatsoever. Not only that, let me tell you a few other things that, that, that just astonish me every time I think about it. People are physically, in the abduction phenomenon, people are physically missing from their normal environments when they are abducted. Uh, police have been called, search parties have been sent out, kids hunt for their parents, parents hunt for their children uh, during abductions, they're not there. Uh, and this phenomenon is not happening. Yet, this is what people are reporting all the time. Not only that, people are abducted in groups and can confirm each other's abductions. Now, oftentimes, these are family groups where they might be in cahoots together, uh, but oftentimes, they're not in family groups. They're neighbors, uh, and they can confirm each other's abductions, uh, or, or, or even strangers whom they meet on the street and they know immediately they've seen this person. And yet, it's not happening People return from abductions and they have unusual marks and scars on their body and sometimes, and I have seen this, fully formed scar tissue literally the next day. I have seen this in person. I, I had a session with a woman once who had uh, was, was perfectly fine. She saw me the next morning and she had two one-inch scars on each hand in exactly the same place that were not there the day before to my unbelievable, breathtaking amazement. Uh, that is not possible, and yet this phenomenon is not happening. People return from abductions wearing uh, without their clothes and never finding their clothes again. Sometimes they return from abductions wearing somebody else's clothes. How would you like to get up in the morning and you're wearing somebody else's clothes that, that would catch your attention, you know what I mean? Uh, and, uh, and you didn't have a fifth of uh, Jack Daniels the night before or something like that. And, um, and yet this isn't happening. Sometimes abductions are observed by bystanders who have nothing to do with it. It's rare, but it does happen. And yet it's not happening. You would think that this type of phenomenon, which is not happening, and yet people are seeing it, and groups of people, and this and that, would be of extraordinary importance to the academic and professional community, because there's never been anything like this phenomenon, and it's global. No, this has never happened before in this type uh, of, uh, of method, in a sense. And yet it's not happening. So if I grant that it's not happening, that people are not being abducted, then abduction researchers have stumbled on one of the most important areas of human cognition and mentality and, and circuitry and the brain and all that that has ever been found. You'd think that neurologists would be interested in this, that, that psychologists and psychiatrists would be. You, you'd think. The answer is not a chance. They, so, so you're no saying whether whatsoever. one accepts the reality of these experiences as reported by many, many people, and if we should add, as reported to many different researchers, not just Dr. David Jacobs, but many people who've encountered folks who claim to have this abduction experience, no connection to you whatsoever, report very much similar kinds of experiences and all those things. So you're saying that there's really a challenge to the academic community to either accept those accounts at face value or reject them and, and then find some deeper neurological or psychological problem. But in either case, it, it's something that demands uh, resolution. Yes. And what you're saying is, is individuals. What I'm talking about sometimes in, in my little list is groups. Yes. Once you say the word groups of right. people, then suddenly all psychological explanations fail. 
But this is part of the phenomenon. Once again, there's never been anything like this in history. You'd think academics would be flocking to this subject to figure out what in the heck this is. People think that they're being abducted all the time, and it's not happening. And yet they're actually missing from their normal environment. Uh, only one case, probably a non-abductee in, in Australia, out of the thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have come forward, is, uh, was, was shown to be not an abduction when she was, uh, she was actually in a car. She said she was being abducted by and a guy who was sitting next to her. He said, well, she wasn't abducted. And, uh, and that was in 1972, the Maureen Putty case in Australia. Uh, that's the only time when anybody ever said that, that they were abducted and they weren't that was not fully investigated and the person was obviously not an abductee, but at least she claimed it and we have to throw that into the hopper. Mm -hmm. but, but that's an outlier and my guess is she was not an abductee. So uh, the fact is though that, that you think that, that they would be interested in this and they're not. Uh, which is extremely frustrating. Uh, you know. I, I think it is extremely frustrating, and I think it's also very, very important to go through it over and over again the way that you did so that people can really come to grips with this question that I, I, I think is, is at the core of many of these kind of realizations that people come to, and that's the how can this be, you know? So people encounter this evidence, this data, whatever you want to call it, and then even if they're drawn into it by the overwhelming uh, amount of it and the impossibility of the skeptical explanations for it, they get to the point and they say, hey, how can this be though? Wait a minute. All these people who I really trust, who are in positions of authority, who should know better, why would they be deceiving me? And then they're really thrown into a quandary. And I can certainly relate to that because that's really been at the heart, I think, of this show, of the Skeptico show. And I want to go through a little bit of my path in coming to you because it has bearing on some of the questions I want to ask you about alien abduction research methodology, uh, overall big picture and where it might be going. Because my path to this has really been through investigating human consciousness. You know, is telepathy real? Are synchronicities real? Are near-death experiences real? That kind of stuff. And my approach has been to talk to researchers, people who study this scientifically, publish in peer-reviewed journal kind of thing, because there is that when you look at psi phenomena or when you look at near-death experience. And what I found that really mirrors what you just said is that there's this rather bizarre disconnect between what the data is telling us and academia's party line. It's kind of funny because it relates to what you're saying in that in one form or another, what I keep running against is this idea that consciousness is an illusion. You know, you are a biological robot. So forget about uh, alien uh, telepathy during alien abduction or even telepathy in the lab. I mean, these folks are saying, there can't be any telepathy because there's no you in there to telepathically communicate with someone else. And I think this meme, if you will, this consciousness is an illusion, you are a biological robot meme, is really at the heart of some of these things where you're interacting with someone and they're debating and they're skeptical. And what they don't realize is what they're really saying. They really don't even care about the data. What they care about is this belief that, hey, you know what? There can be no consciousness. There can be nothing beyond just this biological robot thing. And we can't even go there on a number of fronts. So I'm not even going to try. Do you have any thoughts on the consciousness issue and how that might play into this scenario that we're talking about here in terms of this major pushback from academia and from really the, the intellectual core of our society. Well, you'll be happy to know that I, I, I don't. Um, and the problem here is that consciousness studies uh, is a whole other world uh, made up to a large extent of, of neurologists who are trying to figure out how, how humans have consciousness or indeed how all beings have consciousness because my cats have uh, consciousness and uh, probably even sharper than mine. But um, uh, 
uh, so it, it, it's it, it's something that it's interesting. But you did mention the word telepathy, so so I can talk a little bit about that because that is what is seen on board uh, UFOs, and that's that's what's seen within the abduction phenomenon. Before you go off on telepathy, let me throw a couple other things in there because I wasn't sure how you're going to go with that. But if, if that's where you're going, let me add a couple other pieces that I think are, are out there you're probably aware of, and I'd like you to tie into your answer. If you start looking at extended human consciousness and you look at like the experiments they did with remote viewing at Stanford Research, Ingo Swan, Spy on the Russians kind of thing, all that stuff very well documented, made movies about, and clearly existed. We have Jimmy Carter on record, former President Jimmy Carter saying, yeah, I went into this room and this guy went into a trance and he gave us the coordinates for the plane and we're able to go find the plane. So all this stuff is documented. What is also documented is that these remote viewers encountered aliens. Or if we look at extended human consciousness as it works in laboratory experiments with hallucinogenic drugs, the most famous being really the only one who was granted right to do it is a guy named Dr. Rick Strassman at University of New Mexico. Had him on the, had him on the show. Very interesting guy. Gives these people rather high doses of DMT. Boom. In pop the aliens. He's seeing some of the same beings that abductees are talking about. So, Or if you talk about people who have reported out-of-body experiences, you'll get similar kind of, every once in a while, encounters with these alien beings. So it's beyond telepathy. It's almost wherever you look in these realms of extended human consciousness and the research associated with it, you start bumping into the phenomena that we generally call, you know, encounters with aliens. So any thoughts on any of that? Yes. Um, first of all, I'm not an expert in any of these things, uh, not in remote viewing, although um, uh, when Stanford Research Institute was, was, uh, had Hal Putoff and, uh, and Russell Targer together, they presented, uh, Hal Putoff presented a paper on remote viewing at the Society for Scientific Exploration many years ago that I found extremely interesting. Uh, that's, a, that's as much as I know about it. Um, I do know that people who've had remote viewing and, remo and, and uh, viewed abductions or whatever, that had absolutely nothing to do with the uh, real abduction phenomenon. Uh, and uh, when people channeled abductions, uh, they, their, their material has uh, nothing to do with the abduction phenomenon either, even though they, they're channeling aliens and this and that. Nothing else uh, made any sense uh, to me. So, well, so say uh, what you, tell us what you mean when you say that, because you sound very confident in saying that. Well, for example, um, one time uh, many years ago, there were 30 uh, remote viewers. No, I'm sorry, 30 channelers. I guess it was, who got into a room and, and they were all supposed to channel aliens. One of them was an abductee who reported back to us what happened. <laughs> and uh, this was actually within, uh, she was uh, uh, working with Bud Hopkins, uh, the famous uh, UFO abduction researcher at the time. When she began to talk about what they were describing, we knew immediately that this had nothing to do with the abduction phenomenon. Uh, everything was different. They, 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 they were nice aliens. They, they were they, they were apparently, from what she described, they were all different from each other as well, other than through what they picked up in popular culture. Uh, so, and and I've dealt with people who are uh, channelers, and one person was a remote viewer, as I remember, and their conscious memories of doing this had nothing to do with what they remembered in hypnosis. Uh, as actually happening to them. Uh, and this is, you know, you're dealing ultimately with a problem of consciousness on all these levels. Outer body experiences, um, I've had people have had those too. They recognize immediately they've got nothing to do with abductions. DMT is something that I did read Strassman's book, and uh, uh, it, it wasn't the abduction phenomenon. Then people might be th think they're seeing, seeing aliens or having... There's another one you 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 forgot to mention that was uh, uh, putting electrodes on a person's brain and, and 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 throwing a charge to the brain and having people get a sense of uh, person, and you're, you're, person Michael Michael Persons you're a really nice guy uh, and people get a sense of, of the of, of, of a presence in the room or seeing somebody there or, or floating or a light and that sort of stuff. Here's the situation: we know one hell of a lot about the abduction phenomenon. 
most people don't know anything about it, not even abductees. <laughs> and um, with with Persinger and with others like this, so there have been a bunch like this, what they do is they don't recognize, they don't know anything about abduction. So if the abduction goes from A, something is happening, I think I'm somebody's coming into my home, or so my car is stopped on the side of the road and I don't know why, um, whatever it is, the beginning, that would be A, all the way to Z, I'm back in my car, I'm back in my home, I'm back in my backyard, whatever it is. That's what they can recreate to a degree. I feel a presence. I see somebody, something like that. Uh, they can re recreate a tiny little piece of it. B, through the rest of the alphabet, they ignore. That doesn't exist. They don't go into that. Uh, and all of these other uh, accounts are like that, too. There's no depth to them. There's no detail to them. There's no preciseness to them. There's no chronology that goes on for several hours. There's nothing like that at all. And uh, and, and with re remote viewing, you have people who are seeing religious figures and, and, uh, and traveling around the world and this and that, even though, as I said, I saw a very interesting paper on it once. But, um, but, but none of this relates to the reality of the abduction phenomenon. None of this takes into account the evidence. All people who are debunkers, all of them, uh, of, this, of the abduction phenomenon, and there are, there are no exceptions to this, really, either don't know the evidence they uh, ignore the evidence if they do know it, or they simply uh, um, distort the evidence to conform to their own, own uh, opinions and ideas. I have found no exceptions to that. None. None of them really take into account the full range of evidence uh, of, of the phenomenon of what happens to people over and over and over again, and why it happens, and this and that, and and. I haven't published a book on, on UFO since 1998, uh, on abduction since 1998, and I'm, I'm in the process of, of, of finishing this one I've been working on for the past five years. And I, I must say, I have learned an awful lot more about this subject, and uh, especially about, about hybridization and all that. And nobody has ever ever <laughs> said anything that I've been learning about in, 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 since 1998 it's just because it hasn't been published yet. But hold on, because I think we need to kind of pull some things apart. We need to pull apart the debunkers, the skeptics, and people who have a, a different agenda. But, but those people are out there, and they, they're playing a different game. I'm really talking about the other side of that, people who are, number one, looking at this extended consciousness, and again, I think we kind of mixed a bunch of stuff together there, uh, that, that, that there's a reality to extended human consciousness. Clearly, from a science standpoint, the clearest evidence for that is in the near-death experience, where in some strange way, it's like the alien abduction experience in that we have just mountains and mountains of evidence first-person accounts, group accounts where people have a shared near-death experience, people standing by their bed, but we also have people who have no brain function, are dead, medically dead, who are resuscitated and can tell in great detail the details of their resuscitation, and they've actually done peer-reviewed, published studies comparing how well they're able to recall the resuscitation versus a control group that didn't have a near-death experience. That's established. It's still ignored, denied by mainstream academia and science because they do not want to accept that we really have consciousness, let alone that consciousness somehow survives death in a way we don't understand. But hey, that's the data in it when we have to live with it. So where I think a lot of people are going in this realm is to say, okay, if that's the data and we have to live with it, that consciousness survives death, then consciousness is somehow, in some way we don't understand, separate from the brain or coexisting in the brain, but kind of separate. And then that gives a different spin on all these things that we've been talking about. So your DMT trip now doesn't have to be just an illusion, and remote viewing can have a reality to it, and maybe even medium communication channeling is very problematic, as you mentioned. But let's throw that back on the table 
And first of all, do you accept the idea that consciousness is somehow, in some way, we don't understand the way the phrase I always like is ontologically distinct? You know, it's not just the brain. There's something more to it. You know, it, it's it's an area that that I know so little about, and that I have done no studies in. Uh, that that even to say yes or no on that is is going to is going to be a guess. I I, I just I don't uh, you know I don't know how to respond to that because people have, know a hell of a lot more about these things than I do, and uh, I can only relate them to the abduction phenomenon. Well, and, f- fair enough, fair enough, Doctor Jacobs. I don't want to get us off track because where I really want to do is pull that back to the abduction phenomena because. From my perspective, at it, again, coming at it from this extended human consciousness angle, that seems to be at the core of the debate. Once you jump past all the silliness we're talking about in terms of people saying, well, it, it can't exist, it doesn't exist, you know, once you jump past that and you say, okay, there's some reality to this phenomena, let's figure out what it is, let's figure out what the possible purpose, agenda is, all those things, then you really kind of break down into these two camps. You know, in that book that I mentioned earlier and UFOs and abductions challenging the borders of knowledge, you included a chapter in there from Harvard psychiatrist John Mack, who unfortunately passed away in 2004, but was someone who really, along with you and of course, Bud Hopkins, really drove all this stuff into the public attention because he was a Harvard psychiatrist. He was certainly qualified to tell whether someone was delusional or whether someone had some other reason for making up these stories. He looked at it and said, hey, this thing is real from every way that I can look at it. But his conclusion, and this is further carried on with the other camp that there is out there now, was that these experiences were somehow spiritual, spiritually transformative experiences. And I think we can only understand or even begin to look at those in that way if we look at consciousness as being more than purely biological. But what I want to really kind of ferret out in the the time that we have, the generous time that you've given me, is these two camps, the alien abduction experience as a shamanic initiation, a spiritually transformative experience. Those aren't my terms. Those are the terms you hear from people in kind of the John Mack camp, if you will, as opposed to alien abductions as an intrusion on the human species, as a real abduction in in all the worst sense of the word that you really come at it from. And of course, Bud Hopkins did as well. So there it is laid out. What do you think? Well, I have not found uh, uh, any people uh, uh, since 1986 who found this to be spiritually transforming. You have to understand that the abduction phenomenon begins in infancy and goes into old age and happens with great rapidity. It goes on over and over and over and over again. Uh, these people must be so spiritually advanced and so spiritually transformed by the time they see me that they're living in another uh, plateau of consciousness altogether. That is not the case. Uh, what these people want to know is what in the hell has been going on with them? What, why, is it, uh, why is it that they wake up one morning and uh, they're in somebody else's room and they, they're not a sleepwalker? Or why is it that uh, here, 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 here's an event, for example, two people are driving down the street. Uh, they, they, this is a husband and a wife. Uh, and they look outside uh, out the window of their car and they see a, a light. And suddenly there's a flash. They look at each other and they say, what the heck was that? And they realize it's two hours later, they're still in the car and they're still driving and they're in the same spot. And this is two people and one of them was a scientist. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, this is not consciousness raising, this is like consciousness denying. This is consciousness lowering in a sense. So I, I just, I mean, I don't, I don't have a, a, any, any stake in this. It would be wonderful if it is. I think that John was just dead wrong, John Mack, in his analysis of this. And in fact, he tried and tried and tried and tried and tried to ram the abduction phenomenon into his preconceived ideas about consciousness and never could. 
And eventually, he just people, most people don't realize just he gave up. He said, he said, that's it. I don't want to do it anymore because it could never conform to to his ideas. And two years before he died, he stopped doing abduction research altogether, closed up his peer group at Harvard, and 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 told Bud Hopkins uh, that uh, maybe he had been a little bit uh, too gullible in this uh, situation uh, of abductions and and it could never he could never fit it in to what he wanted it to be. Yeah, but but we have to we have to be careful with that because a lot of people would make the same accusation uh, to, to you. So I, I, no, I that's that, that that they can't do. I didn't know well, they, what they the heck this do. thing was, and I had no no expectations about what it was all about until I started researching it, and then I realized now I'm understanding. I, I hear you on that. In other words, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't stake out a position beforehand. Whereas John had studied with Stanislav Grof, who was very much influenced by Grofian techniques uh, and consciousness raising and consciousness uh, uh, existing outside of the mind and all that. And I hadn't. I mean, I'm perfectly happy to believe that if that if that was the evidence I found. Uh, I, I, you know, it doesn't matter to me. That's fine. But since Doctor Mac isn't here to. It kind of pin down or elaborate on what his position was or how it changed or whatever. The point I'm making is that that research has continued. You know, one of the guests I had on my show, episode 212, was Dr. Janet Colley, licensed therapist, works in the Seattle area, specializes in post-traumatic stress disorder, sees a lot of patients with different kinds of stress, but deals with trauma and has dealt with the abduction experience in great detail with a lot of her patients, just published a book, came on our show to talk about sacred encounters, spiritual encounters during close encounters. We can get down and argue about her methodology, her techniques. I well, think- that's that's the critical event. That is that is that is the arguable point. That is okay, but, absolutely but David, hold positively on. I mean, the arguable point. Right. So how do we get to the bottom of that? I mean, here, here is someone who could kind of throw stones a, a, across the, the yard, too, and say, hey, I'm a licensed clinical therapist. Makes no PhD. difference. Has, it well, has, no, makes no difference whatsoever. The abduction phenomenon hypnosis is unique. It, it it doesn't follow along the same lines as as forensic hypnosis, although that would be the closest to it, or stage hypnosis, which would be the farthest away from it, or, or any other forms of hypnosis to get you to stop uh, eating chocolate cake or smoking or or, or relaxing. You, you, uh, hold on, you're you're saying that that the hypnosis regression sessions that are done for retrieving memories of an alien encounter are are somehow fundamentally different? Yes, and they're fundamentally different because the person has to know a tremendous amount about the abduction phenomenon. The problem here is that in hypnosis, people tend to say things that are not true. They think they are true. They're not lying, but they're confabulating. And I was uh, caught in that early, early on. I have all uh, examples of it that, 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 uh, that, that I can tell you, but I won't bore you with them right now. But people were telling me things that I bought and turned out not to be true. And then you have to learn techniques for how to get around that, how to recognize confabulation when you hear it, and how to push past that and get to the reality of the situation. This is a phenomenon that is clandestine. It is secret. Without secrecy, there would be no abduction phenomenon whatsoever. We'd find ways to stop it. Uh, there, there, it would be a whole different world. But the, in order to keep it secret, they have to keep it secret from the abductee first. And uh, when that happens, they just bury their memory in some way. And I'm obviously using non-technical terms, but there's obviously some sort of uh, blockage uh, for short-term memory. Long-term memory stays intact. But the fact is, though, that, that uh, you have to know the right questions to ask in the right way at the right time. You have to understand what the answers are, and you have to evaluate the answers as they go along. Then you have to have more than one session with a person. You have to have a lot of sessions. The key thing here is you cannot have an agenda. What you're looking for is just the facts, ma'am, as they used to say on the Dragnet TV show. Uh, You're just looking for what happened to them. If they start saying things like why this is happening, that's confabulation. Because they usually, 99% of the time, they have no idea why anything is happening. 
Uh, if they say what a machine is for, that's confabulation. They have to say things that are different than that. In other words, there's a technique to abduction hypnosis that regular hypnotists, no matter whether they're licensed clinical uh, uh, hypnotherapists or not, that they don't understand or know. And they think they do, but they don't. But you got to appreciate that you would get a ton of pushback from someone who's trained as a clinical hypnotherapist and has worked with thousands of people would say, hey, how would you support such a claim? How would you support such a statement as that? I mean, this isn't really your technical training or your, or your background. It's just something you've experienced. Why wouldn't people make the same charges with you that un, unwittingly you have an agenda, unwittingly you're leading people, unwittingly you, your methodology is fine-tuned for you to get the results that you want? I mean, we, there has to be some objective way of figuring this stuff out. We can't just take it on face value that, gee, your way is the right way. It's, this is a difficult question to answer because there isn't a number of people who've come forward with the actual techniques that they used. I'm writing a book on methodology and uh, of, of abduction hypnosis. This is the middle book that's already basically finished. And you'll understand exactly how I work and what I do and, 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 and the problem of confabulation, the problem of the first session that you use with a person, the problem of the second session, the problem with the third session, problems with the fourth session, they're all different, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Let's just take the word, word trauma, which everybody focuses on. If this is a phenomenon that began in infancy and continued with frequency all the way through to when the person is 40 years old and they come to me and they've had an abduction, let's just say the night before, and let's just say a week before that, and, and a week before that, or, or whatever, however many it is, um, the question then is, how traumatic is this phenomenon that has been part and parcel of their lives since they were children? And what I found is that, yes, it is traumatic, but the trauma oftentimes comes not just in it happening, otherwise these people would be wrecks, it comes in remembering what happened. That trauma tends to leave rel well, excuse me, relatively quickly after the second or third session. And there are ways, there are psychological ways of putting into effect, uh, how can I put it, barriers to, to that. Now, I, let's put it this way, helpful uh, suggestions to avoid that. And consequently, the word trauma has become a watchstone, a watchword for for the abduction phenomenon as a whole. In fact, when people come to me for ten sessions, twenty sessions, thirty sessions, uh, you know, over the period of months, I've been fortunate enough to work with people for uh, for years and years and years and years. They understand what's going on. They get it. They 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 know. They know how long it's been going on. We've done stuff from when they were children and they were uh, adolescents, and now they're now they're sixty years old. And then and it's you know, they become like scientist observers in a sense. They're reporting back. They know what is happening now. They are trying to figure out exactly their reasons. They're trying to figure out. They're they're trying to be more precise in their. In, in what they're thinking, uh, I do things on a logical and chronological uh, kind of level so that uh, I'm not injecting anything uh, in, into them. And in fact, I've done experiments with them. I've told them, people, I say to them, you know, what you just told me about this event sounds like a dream. This really sounds like a dream. I don't think this happened. I think this is a dream. And then I'll say, just before I, I do hypnosis, I'll say, this is a dream. It's a direct command. <laughs> when I do the induction, which is a simple relaxation induction, and I start asking questions, they couldn't care less about what I just informed on them of, that this is a dream. They, that doesn't mean anything to them at all. All they know is what happened to them. And I start chronologically. I also know that areas of confabulation are all over the place. And the number one, there's two number one areas of confabulation. Number one, description of aliens. I don't ask people what they look like anymore. Not until later. 
not that I'm interested, I am interested. I will ask certain key questions uh, that don't have to have them confront uh, the face of an alien, but I know that they've confronted the faces of, alien, of aliens all their lives. But when they tell me, for example, the, uh, I remember he was wearing a mask or a hood over his face so I wouldn't see him and uh, because uh, he didn't want me to uh, be frightened when I saw him. I've heard that a whole bunch of times. It doesn't make any sense to me. They've seen these beings hundreds of times, perhaps. You mean to say the one thing they remembered is when they had a hood? So uh, I, I work around that. And eventually I'll ask about the hood. And then they realize, oh, the person isn't wearing a hood. And yet they thought he was wearing a hood all these years. Uh, and things like this. This regular hypnotist cannot do. They're not trained in this area. This is a different area of questioning. You have to be thoroughly knowledgeable in the abduction phenomenon to do this. And you have to understand the role of confabulation. The other role, the other main area of confabulation is recounting alien dialogue. The aliens told me, blah, 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 blah. Well, yes and no. Nine times out of ten, the following event happens. All communication is telepathic on board a UFO. And this is there. Everybody's used to this. Everybody knows this. This is what happens. That in itself is astonishing because if this were psychological, people would not be saying that. They'd be saying some of it's telepathic, some of it I, they hear through their ears, uh, whatever, you know, it, it, it would be all over the map. But if all communication is telepathic and you ask them, well, what do you mean by telepathic? And they say, well, I hear thoughts that, that I convert to a word so I can understand it. Or sometimes they say, I hear syntax, I hear actual words and all that. The question then is, what's to prevent them from hearing their own thoughts and then telling me that the aliens told that to them? The answer is, nothing prevents that at all. They do it all the time. It's up to me to understand this is confabulation. This is confabulation. A lot of people who do this kind of work don't get that. They don't understand that. They have not been, there's no training period for this. There's no standardization. Uh, uh, it's, it, it, there's no standardization methodology, I should say. What I do is logical and chronological. That's all. Thanks again to Dr. David Jacobs for joining me today on Skeptico. There are a number of questions I'd like to tee up from this interview, but I feel like some of them probably should wait until the next episode. What I'd like to focus on today, of course, you're free to take this discussion anywhere you see fit on the comments or in the forum section of the website. But the question that I see has to do with the intro and the lack of acceptance among the academic and serious science community to the reality of this phenomena. It's a strange situation that we're in where the man on the street, if you will, is much more willing and open to accept the, again, rather overwhelming evidence. I mean, we have so many eyewitness reports from reliable witnesses in military and law enforcement in the most respected professions. We have so many of those. And then we have all this government release of documents. How can there still be this complete denial among academicians to dive into this topic of alien contact, abduction, consciousness interaction thing? It's really a strange situation when we think about it. And I guess in that pile of questions there, perhaps you will find something that you want to respond to. Of course, the place to do that is at the Skeptico website at S-K-E-P-T-I-K-O, where you, where you can leave a comment or jump over to our new forum or drop me a note through Facebook or email. While you're there at the website, of course, check out our over 200 previous episodes of Skeptico all there, downloadable for free, available through iTunes as well. And be on the lookout for a new version of the Skeptico website that I've been working on. I've been getting in touch with my old programming side and been whipping up all sorts of stuff. So maybe by the time you hear this, if it's a little bit later than when it first releases, you will see a new interface to the Skeptico website. I hope you enjoy that. If you do or if you don't, please get back to me with your feedback. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. Have a couple of more shows on this topic that I really want to get out to finish my exploration of this topic. And then I have a number of other interesting shows coming up. So if this is not your cup of tea, stick around. This does end and we move on to other things. 
But again, that's going to do it for today. Do take care and bye for now.